Welcome to Vox Pop, the first in a series of episodes interviewing ordinary and extraordinary people throughout the UK. It's born really out of a frustration with mainstream media and the fact that they seem incapable or unwilling to listen to the ordinary man and woman on the street and understand the great harm that's being done through the 2020-2021 lockdown. Uh, so today we're in our first episode talking to the first guinea pig, a volunteer, Paul, who is uh, talking to us from his home in the Midlands. And um, I hope you find some of this resonates with you. I suppose I should welcome you, Paul. Uh, to um, the first ever and possibly the last ever episode of Vox Pop. Hello, Mark. It's an honour to be the you know the the first, <laughs> <laughs> potentially the last, but <laughs> it's a great privilege. <laughs> well, I'm, absolutely, I'm sure. Certainly, Mark. From my point of view, I mean, I, I I don't have the answers to this. I'm just you know, like a lot of people, tr- looking for answers, and I've got lots of questions. And I I find actually that you know just by asking those questions in some cases you can upset people by just questioning whether or not what we're doing is sensible um so actually just having a conversation with somebody who's prepared to get in, get you know engage in a, a discussion about you know whether what we're doing is sensible and whether there are options for me you know whether we're an echo chamber or not i don't know but you know even just to sort of explore some of these these issues you know without being sort of shouted down or you know silenced is, is you know i think is it's a perfectly healthy part of you know liberal democracy so mm. why shouldn't we well i think the thing that surprises i don't know if it surprises me now because i've been following this for a while but what just i find so distressing really is that uh we both live in england um uh, and until the day before yesterday uh i thought that we lived in a um a place where you could speak your mind um, as long as you were, uh, well, even if you were uncivil, you could speak your mind, but hopefully people would be civil. Um, And we seem to have gone down a route very quickly, but I suspect it's been brewing for a while, where uh, the actual agenda of uh, very many people in this country, lots of them with lots of power, is to shut down debate, which I find very worrying. Um, You know, I, I... if you can't talk, um, what do people do? I, I yeah. just don't see a good long term. Well, the, the risk is, is you know, if you can't, if you can't have that's, I think we've ended up in this position actually. Is if you can't have sort of open, you know, quite difficult conversations, what tends to happen is, you know, people decide to look for other ways of making things happen, don't they? And that, that yeah. absolutely, in my mind, that's that's how you drive kind of extremism because if you can't express. You know, perfectly valid opinions. I mean, people may disagree, but they can be perfectly valid opinions. If you can't express them sort of, you know, honestly and sort of, you know, with with good intentions, um, that's a pretty scary place to be, really. Because, yeah. um, yeah. I, 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 sorry, go. Sorry, I was just. I think. I think one of the issues as well is that there seem to be um, there seem to be a lot of bad actors, a lot of people that are they have their view, and they're not really interested in anybody else has to say they just want to portray their opponent or even their enemy i think they think of people as um as either uh not just wrong but evil i mean that's not that's a bit of a cliche it's been said many times by uh mainstream people but i think it's a truth you know the fact that they just jumped into my head there either i've been programmed to think that or um or uh or i think i mean my experience of it is if you're on social media which is a pretty poisonous place to be a lot of the time um a bit this is sort of the equivalent of sort of virtual road rage uh in my view um it never used to be did it that's the interesting yeah. thing it, it, I, I mean i've been on twitter for about 10 years and I, you know when i first joined it it was great fun actually it was it right. was good fun it used to be you know just like lots of sort of wit and sort of banter and you know silly memes and things and then it was really when brexit you know first kind of you know got into the mainstream so it was probably back end of 2015 it became very polarized and you know quite tribal and yeah. um and that's when people started to really kind of coalesce around sort of you know like-minded 
you know individuals and then you end up in your sort of bubble don't you in your group think bubble and uh, which is never particularly healthy well and i think as well anybody who's seen anything that um these ex facebook executives have been saying over the last few years um people that have left facebook and they're saying that, you know social media it's derived it's, it's it's entire purpose is to drive content to you that you express an interest in which in itself is not it's sensible but the problem is that it it creates echo chambers because you only ever then get exposed to um what you already like so um yeah, yeah. i think but i think on top of that the other danger and i found this more and more i don't think anybody uh of with of reason would uh, suggest that um, social media companies were not of the left or certainly left of centre um, in many of the... Th I'm not sure left-right is necessarily um, a useful sort of split nowadays. It's not... You know, I think so, no, I think that... It it's, was probably different, but, um, it, yeah. It's, that, sorry, it's a, it, actually, I, well, I was going to say, I, I find that actually I've got a lot of the people I sort of associate with and, and you know, share common ground with these days are traditionally of the left and traditionally i would have called myself with a small c a conservative yeah. um but increasingly what we find is we're kind of coalescing around you know just values of you know individual freedom freedom of expression you know individual liberty and, and sort of you know the ability to to kind of agree to disagree really um yeah. and that you know it's there's no moral element to sort of um you know your views as such it's you know you can you can want the same ends but you have a different view of how to get there whereas we seem to have got to a point now where it's it's not only the, the ends that you have to agree on you have to agree on the methods as well exactly and i mean i think um uh i, mean, I don't know if you follow peter hitchens on um uh, on twitter um but um i I, in fact, I joined Twitter at the end of the year and I joined it primarily because I was just getting so the end of last year. So I'm new to it. I did join it once before and left it because I couldn't really see yeah. a point to it. And then I came back largely because um, without going into too much detail, I, I, I stopped watching uh, television of any sort about six years ago. And right. um, so I, I mean, I watch films and stuff on Netflix, and what yeah. have you, but I, I haven't watched mainstream media and I don't buy a newspaper. Um, because I just, frankly, my blood pressure would be dangerous levels, I think. Of it it so, does seem to be. I, I always think, do you, do you remember that film, The Day of the Triffids, and, and one the yeah. book as well? Yeah. And, and the, the guy who was in hospital, you know, with um, having an operation on his eyes, wasn't he? Yes. So the day after, he could see and everybody else was blind. <laughs> and um, I, the, the parallels, I often come back to that when I think about the, the common thread that I find that most of the people that are sort of seem to have retained their critical thinking skills is that they don't watch much TV. Yeah. Which is scary, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I mean, I have, yeah, my, my theory, I'm probably not alone. And this is that um, the divide now in society and, and throughout the world, actually, um, or certainly in my experience of the Western world is that um, you can judge very definitely what people are going to think dependent on um, whether they consume mainstream media generally and um, in terms of so for example the lockdown or, or brexit or anything like that so whatever the mainstream media is saying um, that will be one group of people and then there'll be people as you say that haven't watched tv or whatever um, so i i think the other thing with with um, the dreaded uh, the coof which we're not allowed to talk, which i find bizarre that we're not allowed to talk about the one big thing in, <laughs> that's happening at the moment but um is that if you've been personally affected by it so if you've um if you've lost your business or if you've lost a loved one because they have been um you know they've been taken ill and uh, they've either died very definitely of covid or they've died with covid which is two, two different things in my view but um yep, yep. then then understandably you're going to have a personal interest which is very emotional very emotive because you've either lost a loved one or you've lost 20 years of hard work and a, and a way to support your family um interestingly on that um without going into any specific detail i think we're both different on that point in that um and tell me if i'm wrong here but i think from a personal from a selfish perspective if you like from an, an income perspective um you are somebody that's continued working throughout the uh, these lockdowns is that is that the case 
yeah yeah absolutely yeah i mean if anything i'm i'm one of like a probably a a, a smallish percentage of the population but if anything i'm better off because i've continued to work on full salary but without really any of the costs associated with you know going to work so um i i recognize the fact that i'm very fortunate and yet i'm still horrified by what we're doing and the impact it's having on many people i i know that aren't in such a fortunate position i was talking to a friend of mine yesterday i, I had lunch with a friend yesterday which i, I mean is hilarious actually because a good friend of mine that we we just had lunch and um because you know she's technically not in my bubble we were breaking the law you know yeah. having lunch with a friend now constitutes law breaking yeah that's how yeah. insane the, the world we're in has become and you know two two middle-aged consenting adults <laughs> and, just... and the government you know purports to have the right to determine whether we spend time together uh and even worse than that the bit that really kind of almost causes me to kind of lose grip on reality is that there are a surprising number of people in society that actually agree with the government that you know, they think that the government should have the right to legislate who you can meet in your lunchtime, which I yeah. find utterly, you know, extraordinary, frankly. Well, I saw a poll yesterday on Twitter. OK, on Twitter again. And it's a poll. Yeah. It wasn't a very big sample. It was probably about 1500 people, I think. But it was a question asking. Uh, and it was a bit of a leading question, but it, it had four answers. And it went from, where, you know, if lockdowns were, how do you, how do we deal with this from now on? Do we carry on as we are, lock down even harder, free up, or get rid of all lockdowns? And um, I, I voted on get rid of all lockdowns. But, um, and that was probably about um, 60% of people, I'd say, 65% maybe. But there well, that's was encouraging. About, that's, yeah. That gives me hope. <laughs> Although, of course, it depends who set the poll, because if it's somebody I follow, it's probably somebody I agree with, because I just haven't. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, whilst I, it's very noble to follow people like, uh, to mention the name Owen Jones, I just couldn't. I, I just uh, I couldn't follow it. I, I, everything he says to me is just a, oh, anyway. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the equivalent of um, I don't know going into a pub where you know you're going to hate everybody. You just wouldn't yeah. do it, would you? Really? <laughs> exactly. And also, if you do go in and they say something that is by definition going to be provocative to to my views. If I then enter, and I'm not talking about calling him an idiot or anything. I just, you know, yeah. um, put the counterpoint. All his followers will pile on you and, and call you every name under the sun. And you think, well, why do I need this? I, you know, which is, of course, how silencing people works because you self censor um, or you lock yourself into a different bubble. But anyway, um, so I can't remember who set the poll, but it's obviously somebody that is of some like mind to me. So there is going to be a certain amount of self-selection there. But what worried me about that was, I would say 25% of the poll said we should lock down even harder. That, that The reason this isn't working is we're not being hard enough. And I just thought, yeah. there's a They're lot of insane. people. <laughs> they need, they need psych psychiatric therapy. Or they, they what you might find, is, and I, the thing I've learned actually from a couple of friends who are quite technical, is you really have to look at some of those things with a very kind of suspicious eye because there the genuinely is significant sort of, um, you know, f foreign influence, you know, yeah. that's heavily active, you know, bots for one, you know, for one, I'm, I'm never quite sure what they mean by bots, but, you know, malevolent accounts that are just set up to create um, disproportionate sort of results on those things. I saw... Um, there was one particular example I remember seeing a few weeks ago that um, there were literally kind of hundreds of accounts tweeting the same response to yeah. a question. And I've had a, a couple of experiences myself, actually, where I've posted messages and you get these slightly bizarre responses. And I think I've got a pretty good eye, actually, for picking out the ones that um, just don't quite feel right. And you look at the, the syntax or the grammar just isn't quite right. And you yeah. kind of think, mm, yeah, I'm not really sure about that. So they, they get an instant block usually <laughs> if I'm on social media. But it, it, you do. I mean, I've seen a few like that. I mean, I've only I, I've got the grand total of about 140 followers, I think. So um, mm. so I, <laughs> I tend to be more of a spectator than a. Uh, well, I speak, but I just speak out into the uh, into yeah, the void. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I tried. Uh, I tried to you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> where, where you talk sense, which is most of the time, I do try and like pass pass on your wisdom. But uh... when, when I don't talk sense, it's probably because I've had about three months too many on the evening, <laughs> and I go back the next day yep. and think, oh god, what bollocks did I put there? No, no. If sometimes I have to admit I have blushed. So, thought, what the hell? But uh, yep. specifically after the American, uh, the U.S. elections, I um, I don't know your views on this at all, but I I followed it, and I mean, I, well. if you know, I, I, the, yeah, the whole Trump all I would say is like if um, I mean the, the 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 Trump kind of presidency was a bit of a circus in the first place. <laughs> I, I, I you know happy to concede that. I mean, it's again, it's back to our earlier point actually. Like you know, because I don't hate Trump, people think I'm a Trump supporter. Yeah, and you have to start like, every every time you if you defend anything or raise a as you say yeah. if you're a critical thinker, and you yeah. say well. You know, I mean, for instance, the amount of troops in Washington still and 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 yeah, razor wire yeah. around all the government yeah. buildings, and and the Democrats talking about rooting out uh, using this using the CIA and covert ops yeah. rooting out. Yeah, these, yeah. You think this is madness? But if you it say that, people yeah. look at you and go, "Oh God, you know, I, I would never have thought." People have said this to well, me. I I had a, a friend of mine. Well, I've I've lost several friends over the last few months, and um, yes. I'm, frankly quite relaxed about it because what we found was that you know there comes a point when your views on the world are so incompatible and the, the revelation for me was finding them out you know I don't, I don't quite know why we'd not kind of we probably just skirted around politics and things like you know personal liberty I suppose previously and you kind of get preoccupied by sort of quite trivial stuff really you know like just going up the pub and you know going to watch the rugby and stuff like that yeah. um and then when you get down to the fundamentals you kind of really you know get to the crux of people's character and um i was on a, a chat a few weeks ago and just you know when uh, back in the november when the elections were on in the states and um somebody was saying like you know talking about trump and like oh my god i hope trump goes and i say well, I, I just put on there said well what do you know about joe biden <laughs> I'm like, and they don't know nothing about Joe Biden. He's just not Trump. And I said, you know, like he's been in politics for 50 years. What has he delivered from his 50 years in politics, actually, with a, you know, in power? Um, and besides which, he's he's pretty much senile anyway. Yeah. And um, and I was saying that, you know, the, the fact that you know Trump's biggest problem, and it comes, it's, it, it, I think it's back to that point I made earlier, really, about it's it's process, you know, to to sort of so-called progressives is is as important if not more important than actually what you deliver so the fact that trump had delivered fantastic economic results for americans that he increased prosperity you know arguably reduced you know division and sort of racism in the country yeah. um all gets completely ignored because he said some crude things yes. and uh, you know i just find it gobsmacking really that people are so distracted by the sort of process and the message and just don't look at and i i probably i probably empathize slightly because that's that's probably a an approach i've taken in my sort of working life for quite a long time is that um I, I inherently sort of i suppose i like to kind of bend the rules or at least you know test the rules to see if they make sense um and i'm always you know very focused on you know delivering a, a kind of a good outcome um, yeah. And through my working life, I, I've, I've found from time to time you bump up against people who are far less interested in, you know, what you achieve and, and much more interested in, in like the way you do it. And, and specifically, they want you to do it the way they want you to do it. Mm. <laughs> and I think yeah. and, and, and I think that's that's so sort of common across so many sort of spheres of public life now where, you know, there's almost like a. A, a template that people expect you to follow and if you don't follow that particular template well you can't possibly achieve the same results it's um yes it's and, and it's i think it comes from a, and we're both of almost exactly the same age i think so mm. um uh, so we're we're um uh well i'm certainly on, on i suppose i'm on the way to um old fart isn't but uh uh <laughs> so i, I you see so, i don't really it's i always think it's it's the mileage is far more important so i'm i'm yeah you know yeah. A, a, a youngster in that respect well yeah I've got well, plen I, plenty in the tank well <laughs> so, so i hope i have too i know i don't well like everybody i suppose i don't feel like i mean i know some people who i knew when they were i still know now and i knew when they were 20 
23 and they were they were 60 when they were 23 in their mindset you know they were very yeah. Yeah. um yeah. just the way they acted and they're the same now well uh i mean i still would have in my head i still think i'm yeah, whatever age you're going to pick, but you know, 25 or 30 yeah. or whatever it is. But, um, but anyway, that's what everyone thinks, I suppose. But yeah, so I, my, I've got, a, I do like, um, young company. What I do for a living means that I spend a lot of time with, um, people younger than me. Most, most people are younger than me, sort of in their yeah. 20s and 30s and 40s. Uh, well, 40s isn't that much younger, but, um, so, so yes, I think I've got a reasonably young outlook, but I've got a relatively, um, uh, I was going to say conservative, but certainly with a small C anyway, perhaps. Uh, but I think what you said earlier struck a, uh, a bell with me. Um, based on values, um, and, and they are, I suppose, largely liberal, um, classical liberal values of, you know, um, tolerance within, you know, within a frame. Um, and, uh you know all the normal things you'd expect: freedom of speech and um, and um, tolerating others' opinions, and um, and and also in terms of uh, if you go down the economic or socio-economic and um, things like you know capitalism or whatever. I would say I'm I'm very much a capitalist, but I I think what I've seen over the last ten years of my and I'm sure it's been going on for longer than that is that yep. um, we don't really live in a free market anymore. Um, no, no, exactly. I think that's that's the that's it. You know. We we live in a, a kind of a they're oligopolies, aren't they? Really? Yeah, yeah, and, and driven by a lot of the very of the same people. I mean, this cultural. I don't know how much you know of uh, or followed the the sort of the culture wars. This um, which people have been talking about for a long time and people like um i'm i'm, I'm in the middle of it <laughs> yeah <laughs> right okay. I, 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 I'm, I'm on the front line so uh, yeah <laughs> right so you yeah you're fully up to speed on it. i mean I, this is the other thing i find amazing and i speak to and i find this is generally people with either that again watch tv or largely people with families i'm single so i'm quite unusual because i'm in my 50s and i'm single so i don't have um all the normal calls on my time that family people people with families would have um or certainly young families anyway yeah, um yeah. so i do understand um that the, the day-to-day becomes very busy when you've got to juggle all of those calls on your time but i find it amazing that all the people that you would think would be really concerned about what's happening in the world um the fact for example the fact that you can't and this is just an example but the fact that all of a sudden it's classified a hate crime apparently or a non hate incident recorded as a crime on your record if you uh call um a man if you don't call a man that wants to be called a woman a woman if you call him a man uh uh, not that i'd have any particular desire to run up to him and call him a man but if you know if you if you don't recognize the the obvious sort of yeah uh, chemical biological truths involved here (laughs) or even the aesthetic ones Referring you know, to somebody effectively as a man in a dress will get you yeah. uh, oh, in God. prison. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's, yeah. when did that happen? And, and and yet people that you would think would be concerned about this. I mean, I I suppose really largely, um, you could, apart from the fact that I want the best for the people of the world and my country, um, I don't really have any skin in the game because I don't have any loved ones that would be going on after me. So, so you could say, well, if anybody was going to be blasé about it and just go, well, what do I care as long as I'm all yeah. right? Yeah, it would be me. And yet, it seems to be almost without exception, um, unfortunately, all of my friends with children. And I, I just find that. Yeah, it's, it's very bizarre, isn't it? I mean, I, I I've got two two kids. I mean, mine are sort of fairly much grown up now, but. Um, I know as a as a parent that you know I, I, the thought of, and I've seen incidents of it actually where, and I have you know huge sympathy for you know people that uh, you know effectively as they see it are born in the wrong body, and I, I, I've I've known a couple of people that have had that experience, and when I was at school actually as a, as a you know fifteen sixteen year old one of my um, sort of classmates at school you know was clearly sort of on the spectrum I suppose and um I wouldn't be at all surprised I, I mean I lost touch after I left school but I wouldn't be at all surprised you know if he transitioned at some point mm-hmm. the difference being you know that was sort of 40 years ago so um he you know it wasn't an option then whereas now he he would have been probably encouraged to tra- transition um and 
I'm absolutely I, sure I some people he, you know, as a like she, would have been a, a perfectly sure upstanding member like of the there community. There will be some people yeah. like that, that are going to be absolutely and that don't like. I, I mean, I don't other. think this so, is the problem. That, oh, it's quite uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're, they're, about they're, not being able to speak about these things. There, there's plenty of you know, and, and it's right across the spectrum, actually, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. across the sort of political and social spectrum that you know, I, 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 I'm very much of the opinion. It's like just bloody leave me alone and <laughs> you know do whatever you like between consenting adults i really do not care exactly. sort of thing so, exactly um, but, you, but this is the problem is that you you um it, you, you slowly yeah. have to sell it's, it's like this thing with trump the fact that i caught myself just saying it when i raised his name was you feel like you have to i've had this conversation what i do for, for a living and um you, I'm with people for a week or two weeks at a time, and yeah. so you get to know them quite well, and um, or relatively well. On a, you know, you talk yeah, about all sorts yeah, of stuff. yeah, and it'll eventually get round to either Brexit or politics. Um, um, I mean, it hasn't got round to the virus because I haven't really done much work in the last four months. But I mean, yeah, um, yeah. It, it's. Uh, I either say, look, I don't think we should talk about this. Because it's obviously so safe, fun. safe option, yeah. Or, or sometimes, and I've, I, when well, I'm feeling a bit ornery, um, and uh, it might be that the entire crew is, or maybe with one person, because on the on, on the boat that I work on, and they, and they'd be, they'd all be of one view, which would be uh, normally would be in the Trump case, um, and just anti-Trump. Uh, and as soon as you, and I've probably repeated myself, but as soon as you say anything in his defense or even in uh, against his opposition uh you could see people's some people most people might just raise an eyebrow and make a mental note ah oh, right it's okay um but some people don't feel any problem at all at turning around and just calling you out saying right okay well you're obviously a you know, some sort of weird fascist or something and i think well i would first of all i might think that of somebody but i would never say it to their face and secondly um what gives you the right to why is it that the power is so swayed that you feel that you can say that in public to someone you don't know mm. and it's perfectly reasonable and yet i can't even very very um carefully tippy toe around one or two of the misconceptions i feel there are um of the what's being presented um mm. which anyway i'm uh, going off on a tangent but i, I just find that and, that and as i say I feel like I've got to say again now. I'm not a massive fan of the guy. I think he's a bit of a bit of a bore and a and a you know he's not what I would choose as a world leader. But I, I no, think and I, I think what what's become. I, I said to someone the other day. I think he would have been a great president twenty years ago. Yeah. Yes. You know. I think I I I, I watched. Um, it was one of the. I, I actually I I put a bet on him winning in 2016. Um. Because I was kind of you know, going out again, going outside of the media and actually kind of looking at what was happening on the ground in, in the US. Um, and I, I watched um, just to sort of, because I didn't really know much about him at the time. So I, I watched a lot of videos on YouTube of yeah. like interviews that he'd done with people like Oprah Winfrey and David Letterman and people like that in the sort of 80s and early 90s, particularly. Less so sort of more recently, I suppose. Um, and um, you know, the, the guy had some quite, he was clearly a, a very savvy, I wouldn't necessarily say sort of intelligent as such, but certainly not particularly well educated, but incredibly savvy, you know, and you could tell that, you know, he, he kind of had picked up the zeitgeist of, of sort of, you know, what was needed, if you like. Yeah. But I just think it came 15 years too late. And, you know, his kind of faculties and ability to, um, I don't know, sort of just play a slightly more sort of sensible game, really. I think, I um, think he's in his 70s, isn't he? And so he's, uh, yeah. I, you know, everybody, all of us get, um, or most of us at least, get um, more set in our ways as we get older. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I think also he's been in the public eye for a long time. I don't know any, I mean, I know a handful of people that um, have been on TV. Um, and there's an element of even though it might be perfectly delightful people that there is an element of vanity and um ego that goes with if if enough people 
fawn over you. People always fawn over people on TV because they've seen them on TV. So it's ridiculous. But um, and I think you know you have to imagine he's been lauded as a billionaire. He was until he um, decided to to go against Obama. He was a Democrat. Um, he was a Democrat, and he was um, he was loved by the Democrats because he paid their he paid them loads of money. It was only when he turned around and started calling them out, saying, "Well, when I paid you that ten grand check." He didn't seem to not, uh, disagree with me uh, in public, and you, you're not allowed yeah. to say that. Yeah. It's all part yeah. of this, part of the the cathedral, as some people would call it. Um, yeah. Anyway, I, I, yeah, it's 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 funny times we live in. So so, just a few specifics then, because the idea of this um, this thing. Yeah, at the moment it just sounds like two old blugs rounded up the pub. Exactly. I've enjoyed it, but it's. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think anybody hey, else will. Our target demographic <laughs> I mean, people uh, sat with a beer. You can't go to a pub going, absolutely, yeah. bloody agree with that. Yeah. Right. But, um, yeah. Um, in terms of where we're going as a uh, um, culturally and, and um, politically, both yep. the UK and the West. So, um, so first of all, what are your views on uh, how do you think, what year did the police have, do you think, in the UK? Last year. Hmm. Uh, well, from my point of view, uh, they, they had a shocker, as they say. They had a shocker. Um, I, you know, I think there was there was absolutely overwhelming evidence of two tier policing going on, which I, you know is, is is an incredibly unhealthy place for a civilized society to get to. Really, um, you know, the old about... notion of well, I was Sorry. just saying the old notion of citizens in uniform. You, you know, you can pretty much forget, I think. I mean, the police have become almost a paramilitary, you know, sort of law enforcement body. Um, you know, and I, I had some experience. I had two experiences and, and I fell out with a friend of mine very recently over it um, in that um, I'd been very critical online of the police's behaviour. Um my friend had some associations with the police and he was very unhappy about it. And I did point it out that I'd had two very unpleasant experiences at the sharp end of recent police behavior um, at the back end of last year. Right. So I was more qualified to comment, I thought, on that basis. And um, and we're not speaking any longer, <laughs> so, which is so a bit of a shame, but are you able to share those or it's not something you want to go into but um, well the experiences yeah, yeah. Actually, I, i'm quite happy to yeah so i um there was um uh, a demonstration not even a demonstration really it was um there was a, a gathering i would call it in in stroud um and it was essentially i mean stroud if you know stroud it's it's, it's very much a sort of um like a, a people call it a bit of a sort of a hippie town or a sort of an eco town it's it's you know very green it's it's a sort of um it was the birthplace of Extinction Rebellion, for example. Yeah. Um, okay. wow. And yeah, so it, it's got a very sort of long history of activism. And um, this was at the back end of um, November, I think, uh, middle of November. Um, you know, so we'd already, you know, you know, had most of last year. And I was just horrified, frankly, at, you know, the, the kind of, you know, the imposition without consent of, draconian you know unprecedented restrictions on our sort of civil liberties and basic freedoms you know with no no real political mandate yeah. um and i just wasn't i just f find it unacceptable you know fundamentally unacceptable so and i wasn't even really there as an activist so there was this, this and it was just the fact that it was relatively local to me i thought i'll just go along and and see you know for myself that was the the, the, the objective really was just to go and see what happens Right. And I was absolutely horrified. Honestly, it was it was a tr a chilling experience. In that um, there's a place in Stroud called Stratford Park, which is uh, a beautiful sort of public park and arboretum, basically yeah. huge place. I don't know, probably you know thirty or forty acres at least, I would think. Um, and there was a gathering there of probably at most a hundred and fifty people, um, all spread out quite widely spread out and i would say 80 percent of the crowd would have been middle-aged sort of women grannies you know um and it's quite interesting actually one of the things i found interesting through the whole of this kind of um the sort of i, I don't even know what to call it really it's just this um not a resistance it's just this kind of the 
you know, the, the pro-freedom, sort of mm. pro-liberty kind of movement, if you want to call it that, seems to be dominated by women, which I find really interesting. Right. Um, and and, and this, this event, I would say, was 80%, you know, sort of middle-aged women. And I was absolutely horrified at the sort of quite aggressive, you know, sort of almost in, intimidatory behavior of the police, you know, completely unnecessary. You had this, the most placid crowd you can imagine. And yet there was this quite aggressive, you know, um, police presence, quite threatening. And um, I mean, I'm a pretty resilient character. And, and I, I found it, you know, it was making me feel very uncomfortable. Um, and I just, I just could not see any justification for it. You know, there was absolutely no reason for the police you know not everybody there was there through choice um there was like the organizers actually started the, the sort of they did a speech but they were very careful to make sure everybody stayed like socially distanced um yeah. you know you're out in the bloody fresh air and yet you've got this massive like authoritarian police presence intimidating these middle-aged women and i'm like jesus christ what is going on so that was my first experience right. um, and then um a couple of weeks after that i went to london for the day there was a there was an event i think it was the 29th of november and again i was really i wasn't going there to be part of the protest i was just going there almost as an observer and i again was i was absolutely horrified i mean i don't think it, the, the problem you get is the people who are only getting the news through the TV, you know, they get an absolutely kind of corrupt view of it, frankly. I mean, the, the, the way, for example, the, 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 the event in Stroud and the, the same group of people who have sort of carried on the, the sort of activity, they're all, they're all represented as COVID deniers and anti-vaxxers. Yeah. yeah. And it's absolute bullshit frankly most of the people there are are you know they're, they're not covid deniers they're just saying this is not proportionate you know we are destroying the economy destroying sort of social norms and social kind of um goods as it were um for uh, uh, you know for no apparent reason given you know and that's so and none of us are, i don't think i've not met anybody that says like covid isn't real yeah. And all we're saying is that the response is utterly bonkers, frankly. Um, it is. It's hysterical. I mean, I, I no, I, I, I think I, I absolutely. I mean, to put my uh, um, where where I stand on it. I mean, yeah, obviously, COVID is real. Um, and uh, I mean, I know. I mean, I know quite a lot of people that have uh, had it. I know. Um, a handful of, or I know one or two, I know of one or two people that have died of it. I know um, two or three people under under 40, uh, or no, under 45, who have been knocked around by it quite badly. One of them uh, had to go into hospital for a couple of days to have um, oxygen. I am. Um, yeah. and, and I've had chats with him recently, and um, he's of the same view as me. He said, he said well, yeah, it's not nice, and... Um, Obviously, if you're older and weaker and frailer, it might polish you off. But um, if it wasn't that, I mean, it's the, the, surely the thing I just don't understand, and it's because it's not put on the TV, I think, flu has virtually disappeared this year. We, we've had hardly any flu deaths, according to the, uh, all the information that I've seen. Um, well... Yeah, the classic, clearly... the classic line, the classic line I've seen a few times, which, and it's a, it's a great line, actually, is that, you know, why are there no flu deaths this year? Well, because of social distancing and hygiene and people wearing masks. <laughs> so why, so why is COVID, COVID growing? Because yeah. people aren't social distancing or wearing their masks or doing, yeah. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> that doesn't quite stack up. And um, yeah, I was, so just to, the other the other experience actually was mm. almost worse, actually. I was just saying my, my experience at the front end of the police. Um, when I went up to London and um, I met a friend of mine and we just sort of, again, we were just observing really. You know, neither of us were planning to be at the you know the front line and it was it was absolutely horrifying i mean you had a crowd of i don't know probably at best a thousand people or something like that 
you know, and the same, it was the same demographic. I mean, to, to give you like, you know, Piers, Piers Corbyn, I think was kind of like the, the headline act. Right. You know? <laughs> it's like, you know, Piers Corbyn is not a dangerous man. Is he? He's not <laughs> like a, uh, um, and he was like the headline act. And, and then, you know, there was a bit of a kind of, and, and so the, the, originally the, the thing was supposed to start at King's Cross. Well, you couldn't get within 100 yards of King's Cross. The police presence there, you'd have thought there was a major terrorist incident. No, there must have been, queued up alongside King's Cross, there must have been at least 30, um, you know, sort of tactical support group minibuses. So from that, you can kind of gauge how many police that would have been. Yeah. And then yeah. Um, there was a kind of a moving kind of protest march of literally no more than a few hundred people, I would guess. Um and I kind of followed it down through sort of the city. And then um, I ended up um, sort of at the back end of Regent Street around sort of Soho um, area. Yeah. I think I saw this and, on uh, YouTube, actually. Yeah, they, they, yeah. They, and they basically blocked off some of the streets. And they were like, they were kettling people in the sort of, and I just think, well, what? this is like the sort of thing, if this was happening, I mean, it made me laugh actually last week, I was watching the news and they had on the, the BBC news, they had like well, the lead, lead article on one of the things was um, the protest in Russia about uh, Navalny, this guy saying that, you know, you've got, you know, democracy protesters in Russia being brutalized by the Russian police. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, like the irony was completely lost. I, I was like, I put, I felt like the little boy saying, miss, miss, uh, that was what's happening in London. Yeah, yeah. But well, cause, cause, was it just, Boris Johnson tweeted yesterday about uh, he was absolutely distraught that um, uh, all these you know these people are being locked up and this and the other and you, and you go but that's what you're doing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I saw that. I saw that. I, I I just couldn't even bring myself to respond actually because I just thought like it's complete the irony or the the sort of hypocrisy is completely lost on these people. Yeah. It, it is completely lost and. It, yes. It's, um, well, I, I, on the police side of things, I've had very little. Um, co- I've had some contact over over the years with the police, but very limited. Uh, normally, it's bringing up because they decided they don't they don't think uh, having your shed broken into and your five grand lawnmower nicked is worth turning up to look at or something like that. I live out the sticks, um, and I appreciate it's fairly nowadays when people are getting stabbed left, right, and centre. It's probably not that important, but um, you would think a house break would be. Um, worthy of a visit um but um uh so i I normally either get maybe hopefully once every five or ten years at best um some exposure like that um and i've had some good experiences like i'm sure you have as well but uh, um my brother uh had an experience when he was at college um, or university and he uh he had no interest in politics whatsoever but um there was a student union uh was setting up a free bus up to London for the week, uh, for the weekend, if you went to, this is all about leftist organising, I suppose, you know, right, okay, yeah, 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 we're, yeah. Ju- we're just going to yeah. load a, a mob, basically, together. We'll give them uh, a free trip up to London so they get an away day. Uh, they walk around with us for a couple of uh, hours and then they can go and get on the lash. So that's basically <laughs> what he went up for. Uh, so he went up, had a couple of pints in a, in a pub somewhere in London, then they all get sh- sort of pushed out into Leicester Square or somewhere. And um, it was a poll tax. This is how long ago it was. It was a poll tax thing. Right, I was going to yeah. say the poll tax riots. And uh, and obviously, I remember the video. I, in fact, the, you know, it was the one where the something gets smashed through a police window. Uh, somebody sticks a post through a police window, and there's horses everywhere. It's quite iconic. And he was down at that. And so um, I knew he was down at that. So I probably spoke to him about a week later. Mobile phones were not a thing at the time, I don't think. And um, I said, what the bloody hell did you get yourself into? And uh, he was of the same view. He said, it's amazing. He said, there was absolutely nothing. Um, everyone was laughing and joking. And, and he said, the police came in, mob-handed, literally, pushing people over, smacking people in the face with batons. Um, yeah. Now, I'm sure there are, there's going to be troublemakers in the crowd. You know, there's going to be instigators and stuff. I'm, I, I'm sure, it's actually. It's interesting. I was just going to say, it's interesting. I'm, I'm absolutely certain there were some crisis actors there yeah. on the day because there was one incident i saw i was it was literally on regent street i was stood outside hamley's in regent street and there was this like little kind of altercation kicked off and i was looking at the people involved in it and the police pinned this guy to the ground 
and I just looked at this guy and it just none of it looked like credible it, it, it looked like a training sort of yeah. scene you know like from a you know from a sort of a police training college or something it was all a bit bizarre and I've been involved in some you know I'm old enough to have been at football in the late 1970s and early 80s yeah. when you know football violence was a was a serious problem and seen you know people fighting the police and it gets pretty ugly pretty quickly and mm. this was nothing like that this was all looked to you know like it just looked very staged to me none of it rang as true and I would never have believed that such things happened five, you know, two or three years ago. But what I've seen in the last 12 months, I absolutely now believe that crisis actors are used on a regular basis at these events. I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I've, I've not, um, to my shame, perhaps, I've not been to any um, protests or anything, uh, whilst I support them from afar, which is probably totally the wrong thing to do because nothing ever changes but um uh, i think i mean the big concern of course is if you've got something to lose you know uh, the last thing you want to do is get because if you do get on the wrong side of some um uh power hungry or um out of control policeman who smacks you in the face and um then uh tells the magistrate that you assaulted him next thing you know you've got a criminal record and you're in clink so yeah. If you've got something to lose, if you're um, if you're an eighteen year old out there radical who uh, it wants to be the next Che Guevara, um, you've got no career, you've got no job, um, and as far as you're concerned, you're doing the greater good. Then I suppose um, you know it's a lot easier. But when you've got something to lose, and this is what they rely on, of course, in a society, it's it's taking on a big risk to go and get involved. So kudos to you for actually well, going and having a look. That's, that's become very apparent to me actually over the last 12 months. And I've seen, I, I think that that manifests itself very much with some of the behavior I've seen of sort of friends and sort of colleagues of mine where I, I'm lucky in that I've sort of, you know, been sort of careful over the years and I've always lived quite modestly, I suppose. So yeah we've never kind of created a lifestyle that we can't support, you know, uh, uh, you know, without sort of having to, you know, I don't know, you know, sort of earn huge salaries or, you know, whatever sort of thing. So, um, and actually yes. the good thing, it gives you options. You can, yes. you know, take a few more risks. Um, and it's ironic actually, because we, I'd always done that on the basis of sort of, doing it so that I could choose the sort of work I did, you know, to do things that I enjoyed rather than doing things because I needed to earn X salary. Yeah. So it was a sort of decision I made quite early on as a personal choice, just from a, a personal point of view, but it's actually turned out to be a very useful decision at, at the moment because it means that I've got a lot more freedom to act than most of the people I know. Absolutely. And I mean, can, it does give you that freedom. I mean, I'm, I'm similar in that I'm, self-employed but of course i still have to work uh sort of yeah, job out yeah. and work for people but i mean um but I, I i suspect that everybody i work with whilst they might not agree with me because of their um the worldview or whatever um i think you know you have to hope that they know you and go well uh, what's being said about you is i just think it's really frightening that i mean i wouldn't have said people will be the judge but I, I can't see that we're saying anything in the least bit radical and yet um we both clearly have some concerns that standing up for the right to be able to go to work or um, visit friends or, I mean, I, you know, I was all up for the first three weeks, you know, three weeks to flatten the curve the nearly 12 yep. months ago. Same. I mean, it, you know, it made perfect sense, didn't it? And, and yeah. you know, at the time, you know, I, I kind of, I, I fundamentally, I, I kind of, I found it hard work and, and would never be my, but you kind of go, yeah, okay. I kind of get it. It's a, it's a new virus. It looks, you know, pretty nasty. Um, three weeks, it's not going to be the end of the world. So let's just give it a go. And, and uh, yeah. And as you say, it made sense. The, the idea that you go, right, well, the, the problem here is that whilst the virus, because this is how it was sold, this is how I remember it being sold. The, the problem here is that whilst the virus has only got this percentage death rate, which was higher at the time, but um, was still not desperately bad. But the problem is that, if everybody turns up to A&E at the same time, 
people that shouldn't die are going to die because we won't die, yeah. treat them. Yeah. So you go, yeah, yeah. okay, I, I see that logic. That makes sense. But then they've had the Nightingale hospitals open and then closed again uh, through the summer when there was no need for them. And then they closed them before the winter when it's a seasonal coronavirus. I mean, everybody... Got, and that's oh, the interesting see, thing. That's, 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 that's an interesting point you make there that people seem to have lost sight of is the, the seasonality. You know, like if you compare like Ebola, let's take, which is always the favourite kind of, you know, comparison. Yeah. Ebola is not a seasonal virus, hmm. you know. I don't think. Anyway, I don't think. Yeah, oh, well, yeah I'm not, I don't, I don't think it is. I think, it, um, it, well, I, and, yeah, and the, knows, the, the kind of, so. you know, the, the similarities between COVID-19 or coronavirus and flu seem to be remarkable, don't they? Yeah. In terms yeah. of seasonality and, and the people that are affected by it. So you kind of feel like. Well, as well, um, a lot of people, this is where I think it boils down to the media, which is the next question I'm going to ask you. But um, it, if you watch and listen to the media, the media started by saying um, they originally said it wasn't seasonal and it wasn't just the media. It was actually um, the, the experts, so-called experts, um, were saying that it, it wasn't seasonal. Then um, people like uh, Ivor Cummings, I don't know if you followed him at all. Is a yeah, 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 very engineer. much. Yeah, yeah. And um, um, he um, he was basically saying, look, there's this, I think it's called a Gumptus curve or something. I may be saying it wrong, but this typical viral load curve. Basically, when a new virus hits, you get an epidemic at the beginning. You get a, a massive spike, amount yeah, of yeah. a spike. Yeah. And then it slowly starts to drift off to nothing. And then... Um, if it's a seasonal virus, you'll then get a second blip, which will uh, follow the first blip, but will be much smaller in scale because most of the, uh, it's a terrible phrase, but most of the dry wood, dry kindling will have gone. All the people were very susceptible. So it's hitting a smaller number of people. And he also said that certain countries, I think I may be wrong, but I think Sweden was one of them. Sweden had a very bad flu epidemic uh, or flu bout the year before, whereas we had a very... Uh, a very limited one yeah and he was saying originally i think i don't want to put words in his mouth i'm pretty sure it was him that said um one of the reasons that sweden is doing well is because a lot of their dry kindling went in the last flu so they they've got a healthier population he's about metabolic health that's all what he's about yeah um, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh now anyway th that's one thing one man saying one thing but he was saying um the second wave if you like will be um very limited uh, because this is the way a standard viral curve goes. And then that seemed to transpire into uh, lots of um, the media saying, so you're saying there's not going to be a second wave. Uh, and then a lot of people in media on the other side of the argument were saying, yes, it's not going to be a second wave, that's it. And I remember thinking at the time in October, well, that's a bit of a dangerous thing to say, because if it's seasonal, if it's basically a flu or a cold virus, uh, a new cold virus, we are going to see a seasonal spike because people like the older people are more susceptible in the winter. And of course we've seen that, um, but it's, it's because it's seasonal. And, and, and I just don't understand how people can't see that. I, I, you know, I mean, it, they're all saying, Oh, well, hopefully by Easter, it'll be falling off. Well, yeah, it's called the spring. We know it. We know it. Yeah. We know <laughs> it will. I mean, cause you'll, you'll be outside in the sun. Yeah. And, exactly. uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and yet so many people don't seem to be able to see this. I, um, uh, there's a, um, Journo, uh, who you'll know, uh, Dan Hodges, who's on Twitter quite a lot at the moment, and being uh, yeah, Dan, do dopey Dan, as I call oh him. Oh my god! I just uh, I, it's funny because he was one of the people I bet against um, in 2016. I've got a, a, a screen grab from a tweet. I, I offered him a hundred pound bet that Trump was going to win, and right. uh, he wouldn't take it. And I like to remind I, every so often I ping it at him just to remind him. <laughs> So, but but alongside that, then, so police. We've. I mean, I agree with you on the police. I, I'm very disappointed. I think. I, I think the police. Have, they, they need to seriously. They need to, you know, recognise the fact. That's the, the thing that worries me the most is that I don't get the sense there's any recognition by the leadership that they have effectively lost, you know, the sort of trust of the public. Yeah. Even to the extent, if if I found myself in trouble, you know, with some sort of, I'm not even sure I would ring the police these days. I would have no expectation that they would be even uh, interested in most things. And even I wouldn't know what they were going to do when they arrived. Um, I think, I think you're right. I, I, I can say I, I, I've got family members that I would ring first. I think that are quite yeah. useful. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if I needed help. Yeah. Well, I think. Yeah. I mean, if you were. I mean, I, I've had one. I, so I live in the sticks, and I did have cause to call the police about three years ago, in a weird scenario where some uh, person who was clearly not all there um, had been dropped out in the countryside by a bunch of people in a car. I'm not quite sure why, but he he, he banged on my neighbour's window and scared her half to death. A little old lady, and uh, yeah. um, and uh, I got called, and and he he. Um, he ended up on the door. He was basically very confused and clearly, yeah, not all there or what have you. But he was saying yeah, yeah. being kidnapped, and uh, it was all sounding very dramatic. So, um, so I called the police, and, and to be fair, um, they came out fairly swiftly. I was quite given that we were out in the middle of nowhere, um, and they sort of uh, they knew him. He was obviously known to them, and they said, "Oh, right, okay," and got him in the car, and off they went. And um, you know, they did what they you'd expect them to do. So that was good. But at the same time, yeah, I've got. I think the biggest problem is that there's a them and us that's crept in. I don't know if it's always been there, but I think I think there's a definite them and us. I was I was working uh, with a policeman last year, and um, um, he was a really nice chap. Um, he, he was telling me some of the stories that they deal with in London, and uh, God, it's a war zone, absolute war zone. Yeah, yeah that's but, the thing. Um, I get that. So you know, I mean, he fair play to him. He was doing a very hard job, and he was moving on to other things within the police, but. Um, but he, it was obvious that I asked him what he thought of uh, Chrisida Dick, who I think is just hopeless and, um, and very political. And, um, mm. and he said, oh, she's all right. She's all right. You know, and, and, and his entire, understandably perhaps, his entire perspective was that apparently she's married to somebody who's an operative police officer and, um, and she looks after the lads. You know, she looks after her her own, and which, of course, if you're if you've got someone representing you, you want them to do that. But there was no, I think his political views were fairly similar to mine. But there was no view of, oh, I'm a bit worried about the way it's being politicised. Or I even, I think, raised that. Well, what did you think when everyone started kneeling down in the Black Lives Matter um, um, and running away and everything? And he he didn't really answer that. He steered away from that. He obviously didn't want to go down that route. So. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I I just got the I got the view. There's perfectly decent bloke who I got on with, but yeah. it was a them and us. I was civvy. I, he was a, he was. Yeah, a I, I think that's the that's the thing. When you hear the police using the word, I've, I've, I know a couple of police officers, and that's the the word you hear occasionally is you know talk about civilians. Yeah, and I'm like, hang on a minute, you're not a military force. You know, <laughs> you're you're supposed to be citizens in uniform, and that's a really kind of worrying development that that they look upon the general population as civilians, you know, inverted commas. Um, yeah. Especially that, when uh, they go, uh, when they get used politically and they get used to, inf- like, you know, they knock on your door and this chap, I forgot his name. Who's the guy that um, set up, um, he set up a pressure group, um, fair cop um, from the Northeast. Uh, got, I know the guy you mean. Yeah. yeah and yeah. he got rung up for this, uh, apparently some hate speech because he'd like to tweet or something. And, um, I mean, he's got a fair amount of Wonga in his back pocket by the look of it. So he was able to, and he's an ex-cop, so he was able yeah, to yeah. Uh, to push back. But, you know, your average person on the street can't, doesn't get that. And it's very worrying mm. when people are not checking, literally um, checking your opinions or checking your thoughts or whatever it was he said. Um, yeah, I find it very worrying. So on the other side of that then, in terms of what are other great institutions, um, <laughs> where where are you on the BBC? And, and the media in general. Uh, this is degenerating now into two, <laughs> two old men in a pub, isn't it? <laughs> Early BBC, you know. Um, I, I just think that, um, I mean, the BBC is just a, a, another institution that's kind of completely lost touch with the people who pay its wages, really. Um, I, I, I just, I don't really consume anything from the BBC now because it just, it just seems to be such a complete lack of any balance, you know, and not just it's not the lack of balance it's the lack of um like curiosity to dig under the skin of anything i find the whole thing just kind of very kind of you know lightweight and and kind of pretty boring frankly um mm. i mean that you know they're just the, 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 their entire output is kind of metro you know liberal kind of i don't know 
re reimagining of history <laughs> isn't yeah. it really it's yeah. like i just I, I i can't even get excited about it now i mean i um just treat it all like there's almost a bit of a joke really um and and the the the, the thing is back to the sort of I mean, it's quite. In, I think you have a particular p perspective on the world, and particularly institutions like the BBC. If, like me, and I probably I imagine you're the same. Like, if you voted in favour of Brexit, you overnight became, you know, one of the disciples of the devil. And uh, <laughs> um, I, I just find it extraordinary the way that um, you know Brexit voters were represented by a national institution, given that more than half of their viewers actually voted for it yes you know if you take if you assume the same percentage and i, I don't know why you wouldn't um and well, that I was up until that, that point because yeah i mean up until that older people watch the bbc more than yeah true so, so. It, like yeah and um up until that point i think i'd i you know it was probably sort of the back end of 2015 when it all kicked off you know i was a you know pretty regular consumer of the bbc and you know, mostly enjoyed it. And then when you suddenly find that <laughs> effectively you're being insulted on a daily basis by the, the institution that you're paying for, you kind of get a bit cross, don't you? And um, yeah, I mean, it's exactly. quite funny. I mean, I just the characterization of, you know, Brexit voters as kind of low information, poorly educated voters, I just think is is the ultimate in sort of self-validation isn't it oh we voted to remain so we must be you know we clearly must be more intelligent I'm therefore more sophisticated, so, yeah, and, more sophisticated and cosmopolitan and, and yeah. i mean it's funny because I've, I've spent quite a lot of my working career in, in europe not sort of working out there permanently but you know working i worked for a french company for 10 years spent a lot of time in france um you know spent quite a bit of time working with german companies over the years and you know, I've travelled around sort of significantly, and it was actually that experience that persuaded me to vote for Brexit. Ironically, <laughs> I think if I'd have travelled less and seen less of it up close, I might have been more inclined to vote Remain. So, and, well, and again, it, it's sorry, Mike. Just to, around, I was going to say back to your point about you know the thing that I couldn't kind of like actually being in favour of Brexit is a perfectly valid political choice. You know. Lots of people, well, obviously 17.4 million of us decided that, you know, given these two choices, actually, we'll have that one, please. We like the look of it for whatever reason. And then you had this entire like, media establishment demonizing us, you know, for all these spurious reasons that were all completely fabricated um, just to make them feel better about the fact that they, they effectively picked the wrong side. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I find what I find really surprising is that, as you say, it's the establishment. That's the key. It's always the establishment uh, uh, supported by the media and everything else. It's always the big corporations and everything else. And yet it's always spun to be the other way that that um, somehow Nigel Farage, for example, to use a, a, you know, the the, the, the sort of the, the main icon, bogey man. Yeah, the bogey yeah. man. Yeah. And, you know, oh, him and his mates. Well, Nigel Farage. You know, he's comfortably off, I'm sure, but he's he's not um, some massive corporation. He's not Amazon. He's not. It's all of those corporations that are um, pushing for um, closer union because they want to have one big market. They can just yeah. right, okay, That's I it. can just yeah. cater for that market. Uh, they can I put their warehouse anywhere in Europe. Play you know, everybody the massive off distri them. distribution centre wherever they want in Europe. Yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, I saw some of that. I mean, I got involved to, only on a, to a small extent. Um, the company I worked for, we sat on one of the European sort of panels for, um, you know, product certification. Right. And it was an absolute education, actually, because surprise, surprise, the certification is orientated towards the products you make. <laughs> <laughs> Shock, horror, you know, <laughs> and um, and actually predominantly designed to, like, there's a, a slight element in there of like making nice products that, you know, protect sort of consumers, but a far more important aspect of it was creating barriers to entry for other participants in the market. Yeah. I, I it's, I think, I mean, what's happened recently, I think has probably showed it up a lot uh, with the, uh, the drug 
scenario with yeah, um, yeah. is it Pfizer or I always get mixed up with which one is which, but um, it was uh, AstraZeneca. I think it was the AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca one, wasn't it? The Oxford yeah. one, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that fairly blatantly made the case that at the end of the day, they're just a protectionist outfit uh, full of um, governed by a load of technocrats. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, I think perhaps a lot of people have now seen that. I think they've exposed their face a little bit, but I, you know, I don't know how much that'll stick. There are still people out there that want to rejoin. I find totally a little bit pathetic to be honest but um it's taken us bloody 30 years to get out but uh anyway um so so i think we're probably the same view on europe so probably europe is something we can we can skim over to some extent but um we, we can uh, sum it up in one one very short sentence love right. europe don't love the european union uh, too right absolutely couldn't agree with you more there you go uh, move on uh, yeah okay um so Right. So next next thing I've, I've only written, I mean, this has really just been, as you say, two blokes speaking, not in a pub, but um, but I did have a question. In an ideal uh, just, world, it would have been in a pub, wouldn't it? That's well, the thing. Exactly. That would have been much better, wouldn't it? Um, in a free liberal society, it would have been in a pub. God, remember that? That's, yeah. yeah. I, um, I just, I'm going to go a bit edgy now. So, um, and um, this is, uh, you know, you can, you can stay away from it. Well, I, I'll say edgy. I'm being sly, I'm slightly joking, but uh, maybe not. <laughs> What's so, edgy? Um, yeah, edgy is uh, very, very. Uh, yeah, no, it's in the not eye really. Of the go on, I don't go, think. Go I don't think it's edgy. I think it's. I think, but it is definitely. Um, you, what you say on this could definitely have people raising eyebrows. Um, what you have obviously heard, I'm sure, if you're on Twitter, of the Great Reset. So, uh, which uh, I think most people have got to this point would would have heard of. So, what's your take on the Great Reset? Where do you, where, what do you think is the uh, is there any truth to um, it? And how much? Well, it's clearly it? it clearly is a huge amount of truth to it because it's published on the WEF's website. So you know, yeah. like, and when people say it's a conspiracy theory, you go, well, actually, no, it isn't. It's a written manifesto. You know, and here's the link Prince to the Charles website when he, he opened the. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. What did he start so, talking about? And um, and it, 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 I'd sort of, if you take some of it at face value, you'd go. Yeah, actually, I can kind of get on board with a lot of that. I just frankly don't believe any of it, mm. given that the people that are promoting it are people like Prince Charles. And, you know, you've got people like um, John Kerry was a classic. Did you see the interview with John Kerry the other night? Yes. I, uh, maybe not the same one, <laughs> but I have seen an interview with him. Yeah, just Justifying why he needed to fly around the world on a private jet. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Because of, you know saving the planet basically and, and like the, the the hypocrisy is beyond staggering and um and frankly uh, it's you know when you've got the likes of klaus schwab and you know the sort of the bilderberg group writing these manifestos forgive me if i don't somehow think they've got my best interests at heart yeah um yeah. and I fundamentally You'll be happy and own nothing. So does that? Yeah, not I mean, I, fill you with... I take. Yeah, I, I, I sort of some of the stuff. I'm, I'm, you know, I think is kind of. I'm sure they're just kind of testing the water. You know, they'll yeah. throw this stuff out there just to kind of see what reaction they get, and it's a bit like you, you get it in politics where they sort of float these crazy policy ideas just to test the water sometimes. Yeah, yeah. and um, I, I mean, I think the thing that does bother me is that I. I from all the research I've done and sort of looking at that, you know, the, the, basically the banking system is effectively likely to collapse at any minute. You know, the fiat currency system has kind of reached the end of the road. Um, you know, the, 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 the sort of global debt has just become beyond the realms of fantasy, really. And, you know, I just yeah. don't quite see how we, we extract ourselves from this sort of position. And um, I don't, if I'm quite, I mean, I don't really understand it enough to, to, you know, comment too much on, on sort of the way the banking system works other than that, you know, to anybody that if it's so opaque that it's kind of impossible to understand, you have to sort of question, you know, what's going on really. And um, well, I, I, think I think it's, it, go on, sorry. Sorry. I, I, no, I just, just really, I think on that with the, with the, I think anybody who's got a half understanding, a rudimentary undergraduate understanding of basic economics must look at money supply and look at, if you keep making money, you are by definition devaluing it. 
yeah. um, if you're yeah. just printing it or electronically creating it. Um, and that's been going on for decades. And it's just accelerated to the point now where I, I, the, the only thing, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll shut up in a second. The only thing I could see that I think links to Great Reset, which which I don't and I don't have an answer for. Uh, I, I don't think that you know a virus was set up in order to create this uh, demolition of the world or whatever. But I do think that people perhaps look at it and go, "Oh, well, look, they've said this. That, that um, they've said this is a great opportunity to um, to change the world for the better, to have a great reset," as uh, Klaus Schwab would say. So, um, so they're obviously using it. And I think if you were of the view that sod it, we're going to have to do this because money money supply is out of control. Yep. Then you wouldn't be so worried about borrowing, which seems to be the issue in the West at the moment. America and Britain and everywhere else, they don't, I mean, it's un, unprecedented amounts of borrowing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So why are they borrowing like that? Uh, perhaps because they don't feel they're ever going to have to pay it back um, because they're going to, well, obviously, wealth tax is going to be the next thing for everybody. Um, anybody who got anything is going to be hit with well they're already proposing this on property aren't they get rid of stamp duty yeah, yeah, and bring yeah. in a, a, a wealth tax if you like a tax on value yeah i mean i, I suppose it, it, it kind of all boils down to the fact i think at the end of the day that you know governments don't have any money basically they don't create money do they they, they basically you know tax the population and so um you know these amazing you know like the whole furlough scheme and sort of these, you know, 300, 400, 500 billion pound kind of funds, uh, you know, are only coming from one source. And that's us, basically, eventually. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the people that are enjoying their furlough now, you know, if they've got kids, their kids are going to be paying the bills, basically. Yeah. And, and their yeah. grandkids. So, and yeah, their grandkids, probably. Yeah. So, which again is like, it's not my my particular worry as long as I can see myself yeah. out. But it, it does worry me the, for the future. For else. The thing that the thing with the whole this whole great reset. I mean, I think that the, you know the green agenda. I mean, again, it, it it's it's the hypocrisy that really kind of triggers me, if you like, in that you just know that the people espousing you know all of these fantastic lifestyle changes won't be doing any of it. Yeah, that's, that's the fundamental premise that uh, my one of my great political heroes, and I can't remember the guy's name, is the the guy that was the president of Uruguay up until about ten years ago. Right. And um, I I'll have to I, I should do some research on him and remember so I can remember his name and quote it. But he's probably the the only sort of politician who has lived by his own sort of um, you know. From, you know, sort of um, policy. I know who you mean. He had a. He used to drive around in a battered old car and um, battered old, yeah, car. Yeah. And he, he yeah. took took a modest salary and you know lived very modestly in a small house. And you know the the sort of fact that the, the the people that gravitate towards kind of you know high levels of politics are obsessed with status and prestige. Yeah. Um. And and so. It tends to attract sociopaths on the whole, I think, anyway. Um, I'd agree with that, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and it's just, again, it's, I just cannot bear the hypocrisy of it where, you know, it, Prince Charles telling you to, like, you know, do all these green things. He lives in, a like, a hundred-room mansion. It's, it's just beyond breathtaking, really, the, the, the kind of the, the sheer chutzpah that these people have to tell you how to live. It, it is amazing, and, and and nobody. This is the problem that the media don't even point it out. Uh, you're looking at it, going, "Well, am I the only person seeing this?" I mean, it, it is, and I'm it's sure like, we're not the only people seeing it. But. You're like the, the the boy who said that you know the emperor's got no clothes on, isn't it? It's like yeah. everyone's cheering. You go, "Well, he's he's got no clothes on. What are you on about?" <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I do wonder. I mean, I th I have a, a theory that um, that we are going to see. I think this will all fall away. Most of it, at least, will fall away very quickly. That what I what I fear is that it set a precedent. That you know, oh right, okay, let's have a lockdown now because of well, they're already saying a green lockdown for um, environmental reasons, um, which will be the next thing. Um, and if it's not a lockdown, it'll be, it'll be you know, well, as they're doing now, taxing meat, taxing um, you know, because it's a carbon tax and all this sort of stuff. So they're already bringing it in. They're already engineering society more and more and more. So I, that's that's a worry. But I think were they to, as with Christmas, when they decided to um, 
allow most people to have Christmas and then at the last minute they, they panic. But beforehand, the only reason they gave people five days for Christmas was because they knew no one was going to stick to it. So yeah. they thought, well, we uh, can't certainly. illustrate we haven't got that power. And that's all it boils down to. Once people like me, frankly, decide I'm going to the streets and uh, this is, I'm, I'm bloody angry and this is not going to stand, then I think things will change. Um, people already, I think, are largely ignoring a lot of the lockdown. But if you, you know, if there's no pubs or restaurants yeah. open and no shops open, there's not well, much I, to do. Well, I, I went out and um, I had a, a, a sort of a, a, a work meeting today um, and we, I met a, a contact for a coffee and um, we sort of had a, a, a meeting out in the open air, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing I did notice, even though there's not much open, is how busy the town was. Yeah. And, you know, we, we clearly weren't there for our essential exercise. And, um, you know, I have to say, I mean, I, I was listening to the radio coming home, actually. And, you know, these adverts that they're playing at the moment, you know, like, you know, if you about you know is your trip really necessary and i'm like well yes actually it is because like life has to go on yeah so on that yeah. basis yes it was necessary it uh yeah uh, did you uh did you clap for captain captain tom uh, no i didn't clap like... <laughs> i am um, again I I'm, 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 I've, I've moved beyond um, the Pav pavlovian response yeah yeah i think it's disgusting that um because he seemed a perfectly decent old chap and uh yeah. did some good um and i think it's i think the thing that's really disgusting and very few people have called it out james but delipol did in um, conservative woman the other day but um is that he was very clearly just being used for propaganda that the ugliest bluntest um type of propaganda and i just uh, you know with the with the whole because it, it was a clap clap they had this minute yeah. silence yeah, um yeah. I, d I didn't see well, that. Have you seen the, the interesting thing? Is that, yeah. Um, there's some interesting links with his um, daughter and son in law as well. I, I was quite interested to sort of see some yeah, information I on. Do, uh, that have been alleged. Yeah. I don't, I, I, um, I haven't looked into it and I don't yeah. know. And I mean, there's so much you have to be so careful. Uh, but, yeah. To be, and to be honest, I'm not, I can't, I don't really care if I'm honest. I mean, yeah. the, you know, he was a fabulous old guy, you know, lived an incredible life. He was a, you know, I mean, it's sad, but celebrate the amazing life he had. You know, exactly. he's 100 years old. You know, you, you, and actually the interesting thing that nobody seems to be quite clear about is actually did he or did he not get given the vaccine? Well, you know, I, I was thinking about this. and I Somebody shared something on Twitter the other day on, on Sky News, but it, it, it wasn't so much that because these things can be tweaked and what have you. But uh, it suddenly I remembered that he had the, he did, I'm sure he had the vaccine uh, early because again, they used it as a propaganda thing. Captain Tom's waiting for his vaccine with uh, somebody else of great and the good. Um, uh, but even if he didn't, uh, he went into hospital with pneumonia and then contracted COVID. So um, that has its own problems. You know, it's, um, I, it, it, he either went to, because that's, that's how I understand it, because, um, I know people have been into hospital this year and uh, they get they get a test before they go in or when they arrive yeah. they get a test then they get another test when they leave presumably so they can say well you didn't catch it off us um uh, and that worked out fine they did a very good job they seem to be able to keep everyone separate but um yeah either way it, it does it is very murky and I just don't like the idea that this um this old chap who who um you know did some good uh has been yeah. um used by yeah, let, the, let... Let him, let him, let him go in peace, as it were. Yeah, because then you the get thing, everybody yeah. else slagging him off and saying he's part of the. Uh, when you've got Church of England vicars saying, um, "Oh yeah, part oh, of the no. white supremacy or something," you think, well, "God's <laughs> Just, sake!" Yeah, if they're, 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 there's an institution that's completely lost its way, isn't it? Eh? Yeah. The Church of England, good grief. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. They, I think they've been lost a long time. I think they, didn't they used to say that the. Um, uh, the idiot son went to the went to the Church of England. That was always the unfair thing. They well, maybe not. Oh, that. Is, oh, that's just a new way. I've not heard that one. But, in so. the thirties, they said the first one goes to this is you know um, uh, arist aristocracy. The first one inherits the estate. The second one goes into the forces. Uh, um, the third one goes it's somewhere else, and the fourth, the idiot son goes to the church. To the church, um, oh, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think there might be some truth in that. Um, so. So, Rania, because we've been talking, believe it or not, for an hour and 39 minutes. So I know, it's um, quite shocking. It is. I can't believe anybody is still listening if they even started. But um, so 
where do you see the next six months going then in the UK? Any any anything good or bad you could see coming um, out of this? I, I I'm I'm quietly optimistic actually. I think you know the there's kind of two two groups i think that are critical there's the group of people like myself that have been sort of pretty skeptical the whole way through and literally are chomping at the bit just to kind of resume normal life yep. and then i think there's another group that has been incredibly trusting and tolerant up until now um based on particularly the vaccine as the miracle cure and given all the sort of noises that the you know chief medical officer and people like that are making that you know the vaccine you know what doesn't mean you, we still don't need to socially distance or wear masks and all of the other paraphernalia of um, current sort of restrictions if people at that point don't go hang on a minute what is going on um, and i think there are plenty that will actually um because I think when it starts to impact people, you know, in that they've, they've gone through this trauma, they've, you know, taken the vaccine and nothing changes, you know, potentially they've still got to, you know, they can't go on holiday or there are lockdowns and those sorts of things. I remain quietly optimistic that enough people will say, no, thanks. We're not having it. I think you might be right. I, I think also, and I was going to say it before, and I, I went off on a tangent. I think if that doesn't happen, then once they finally stop, um, oh, I forgot what it's called because I don't get it. Um, this payment that you get, um, eighty percent of salary that people a furlough, get, furlough, a furlough. Um, so once all these people uh, stop getting furlough and start looking at losing their either having lost their jobs or losing their house and not being able to put food on the table i think uh where, you know when enough people have perceived to have nothing left to lose i think things could go very quickly in one direction so i think yeah. um let's hope we don't go there but I mean, um, what, what i what i see a lot of at the moment is um you know particularly like if you take sort of tradesmen for example they're just all playing the game you know none of none of them think it's real yeah you know I've had a few tradesmen here and friends of mine that have had builders in and stuff. And like, you know, they, they kind of play the game, but at the first instance <laughs> that you get to have a conversation, you get the response. Yeah. Well, it's a load of old bollocks in it really. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and they're happy actually because like the tradesmen have been pretty much flat out the whole way through. So oh, they're, yeah, they've been really busy. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, in fact, trying to get building materials is the biggest problem because of course, yeah, the supply chain has broken down a bit, but um, yeah, I had a tradesman in this week and uh, he rocked up and um, yeah, we actually, um, he had a mask and he went to put it on and I went, look, just don't worry about the mask, mate, but, you know, so if you don't want to, and he went, oh, right. Okay, good. I mean, he's working on the roof, you know, and what's it, what's, who's he going to infect? Uh, it's, um, uh, you know, it is, it's, it's, oh, I, I, you know, I'm all for being sensible within parameters, but um, yeah, it just, I think it just gets a bit silly. But uh, so, so you think things are looking are looking up for the for the for the foreseeable I, future? I, I'm, I, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic because I think, but I'm equally. I think my mantra for life generally is, you know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Yeah, and um, I do kind of worry that there's a sort of a a, a sizable section of the sort of establishment, should we say, or you know the sort of malevolent actors as i think you called them hmm. mark which is that actually there's people that quite like this they like the control that it gives them um the people at the on the extreme sort of fringe of the green sort of movement are quite happy to see the economy destroyed if it means that you know we stop flying and stop driving cars the fact that thousands and thousands of people will be on the poverty line doesn't seem to concern them too much yeah um and so it's, I do feel it's on a bit of a knife edge. Um, I was talking to somebody today, you know, that I can't make my mind up with our government, whether or not they are just kind of almost paralyzed by political kind of fear to do what I see as the right thing, which is to kind of get society opened up as quickly as possible, um, you know, whilst protecting the most vulnerable. Um, 
you know, they, they seem to be far too conscious of the media in terms yeah. of their policy making, which is a really bad place to be in my book. Um, or actually are there sort of malevolent actors in government? That's the, that's the kind of worry, I suppose, is that, you know, or, or you know, behind government, that, that this great reset and the slightly more sinister aspects of it actually are part of the plan. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I'm, a, again, unsurprisingly, not a, I'm of a similar view. I actually wonder whether the permanent government, um, which is full of uh, largely Oxbridge, um, you know, permanent secretaries and stuff, uh, anyone who's had um, a lot to do with, I've, I've had some dealings with um, central government uh, in my career, and um, can't say I was hugely impressed with my contacts with them, but um, I do wonder whether, I think there is a permanent government um, that is, they're going to try and do what they want to do no matter what. And I think probably Tony Blair's got a lot of uh, to answer for, for that. I think he politicised yeah, yeah. the civil service. Um, so so there's that. Uh, so I think even if the Conservatives had wanted to do what you would think Conservatives want to do, I don't think they're going to have an easy ride of it. Uh, uh, Priti Patel being a case in point, really. She's obviously fighting, a well, she she lets people know that she's fighting a battle from within whether she is or not i don't know but um so um but i also think i think it boils down to what we said at the beginning of this conversation which was i don't think the conservative party um is fit for purpose i don't think that that i don't th personally i don't think they're conservative i don't think you could tell a difference between the conservative party and what the labor party have done over the last uh, few uh, times they've been in power um and and if they were different, they would have turned back the things that Labour put in in place, and they haven't. They've had over ten years now to do that, and they and they haven't. So, so I personally, my view is that the Conservative Party is unfit for purpose, and the Conservative Party should be destroyed. Um, and uh, for somebody who, I mean, I'm not a true blue Tory. I voted um, I, to my everlasting shame. I voted for Tony Blair back in the days in ninety seven or whatever. I'm, I'm going to hang up. I'm going to hang up now. <laughs> I, I'm really embarrassed about it. But I, when Princess Diana died, uh, which I remember very clearly, um, and I saw him speak, he wasn't long in power. He'd only been in power, what, a year or something like that, was it? A couple right. of years. And when he, when he gave his speech, I suddenly realised what he was. Um, right. And I thought, oh, my God. I've been totally and utterly duped. That's really um, interesting. What what was the trigger for that then? I'm I'm intrigued. I think it was the obvious insincerity more than anything. I think it was just that he was clearly well, I better not say anything publicly of exactly what I think of him, but I'm sure there's millions of people who think the same way. And I suddenly realized, wow, you're just a con artist. You 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 are and, and and since then, um, there's some very interesting films and stuff that have been uh, documentaries uh, when he was bringing in all the laws which are now being used against us. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, loss of freedoms and loss of rights. And there was there were I, people. I'm, uh, there. Yeah, I'm going to say I'm I'm I, I'm absolutely. You know, he was he was engineered, wasn't he? Yeah, I think yeah. he was clearly engineered as a candidate to to implement some of these things. I mean, I. I I could easily believe I'm, I'm not a religious man, but I could easily believe he has sort of satanic collect, you know, connections. <laughs> I just <laughs> he. <laughs> well, if you look at I, I, my favourite um, childish thing that I do on Twitter um, is uh, whenever I see anything mentioning him, and there's a photograph of him, uh, I post um, uh, a photograph of Gollum underneath uh, from the Lord of the Rings. Cause every time I see a photograph of him, he looks like more and more of his life essence has been sucked out of him. And he just looks, yeah. you yeah. know, he looks like a man who writes. I'll let you, um, I'll let you, you, you can personal, you can PM me or email me your, <laughs> your, your innermost thoughts on the subject. And <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I'll enjoy that. I think. Yes. I yeah. think I'll, I, well, yes, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Um, see it as therapy. Yes, exactly, exactly. So no, I'm certainly no. I, I think he's done more harm to this country than anybody in this last hundred years. Uh, I mean, I think it's an it's an interesting point you raised, Mark. Actually, I mean, the thing that occurs to me that there are now probably tens of millions of voters who feel politically homeless. Yeah. You know, given you know, if there was an election tomorrow, they'll have probably, if they're lucky, they might have four candidates to choose from. And. I, I would imagine 80, 
plus percent of the voting population probably votes through gritted teeth. Um, you know, picking the least worst option for them. Well, I've spoilt votes before now. I've actually taken the time to go down to the voting booth and put across through the you know, sport paper, um, yeah. which is you know, just because they do count the sport papers. And I just think, well, yeah. for enough of yeah. it, because we don't actually get a chance to say anything. And I think more and more people are starting to realise that we don't live in a democracy, really. Um, it's a functioning... What it's a it? functioning sort of two-party state, isn't it? Yeah. I'd say, you know, and and actually even, you know, closer to a one party state now because the sort of conservatives and Labour candidates in most wards are effectively interchangeable. Briefly, uh, bouncing back to this whole Great Reset thing, I think it's very interesting that the Tory party, Biden, uh, Klaus Schwab's um, uh, World Economic Forum, all use the same phrase, uh, build back better. Mm. Uh, that's not a coincidence. I'm sorry, but that's just not. No, a coincidence. it's not. No. And, and you look at, even look at the supposedly more independent right wing, or right of centre um, conservative MPs out there. Uh, they've really shown their colours um, uh, it, during this uh, this time, both on on things like um, green policies and also on the uh, the COVID thing. And I think um, I think a lot of people have seen that and gone, oh, I get, I get it, right. I understand. Yeah, I, 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 I always take the view that, it, you know, politics is, I've, I've dabbled in politics a bit, you know, a few years back. And the thing I learned the most is what an absolutely filthy game it is. Yeah. And I would never want to soil myself with it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, the thing, you know, like, the, again, that I kind of came away with is that having kind of fundamental principles is a bit of a luxury if you want to go into politics. Mm. And... <laughs> Unless you're prepared to sort of, you know, negotiate on your principles, um, you won't get very far, frankly. I think you're probably absolutely right. I think that's the problem, isn't it? It's all well and good us saying, oh, well, you know, we do this, that, the other, but you just won't get very far. That's the problem. You've got to make deals. You've got to kiss the right backsides at the right time. Otherwise, you're never going to get a leg on the, on the foot on the ladder. Um, that's the thing. You, you'll never. That, and I, I, that's my impression of sort of recent elections, actually. And you look at the candidates and, um, the selection process is such that, you know, the, the, if you're a potentially a bit of a maverick, you just won't get through the selection process. You know, yeah. the, the, the selection process is designed to, to sort of weed out people that might, you know, be sort of independent. Yeah, so the central office in the case of the Tories, isn't it? Yeah, it's just, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and apparently the majority of the people in central office in the Tory party are still uh, Cameroons, if you like. I think they're yeah, called. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, which is very much of the... Um, Macron style of, um, uh, you know, uh, cookie, cookie cutty, cookie, cookie cutter politicians. But, um, well, no, it's, it's, anyway, I, I find go. it a little bit depressing, but at least there are some people out there that feel the same. So, um, when the pub's open, we'll be able to go for a beer. <laughs> and we'll, we'll do another one of these and bore people, but at least we'll have beer this time. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, but we've it, done, yeah. believe it or not, we're an hour and 53 I know. minutes. Good um, grief. I would be amazed if anybody is listening still, but um, I, I think um, you better get the editing suite fired up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, is there anything else that you wanted to um, th any anything you wanted to scream out to the uh, to the cyber cyberspace that um, you can't uh, really got I, touched uh, on? That? No, I, I just I think you know pe people need to. The thing that I'm most shocked at with this whole kind of COVID thing and and the sort of the way politics is going is that people really need to kind of regain their confidence to make choices for themselves. I'm just absolutely horrified at, you know, when people, the phrase I've seen, you know, used a lot recently is like, you know, are we allowed to do certain, certain things? I'm like, for God's sake, you know, the, the, my fundamental premise is always I'm allowed to do whatever I choose unless it's strictly prohibited. And the fact that, sentient adults are questioning you know the whole thing about am i allowed to go and see my dying grandmother i'm like yeah. jesus christ go and see your dying grandmother you know because like <laughs> you won't get another chance so, i just cannot understand and i would sort of i don't know i'd be interested to, to know how we do something about it to kind of give people back their um autonomy to some extent to make decisions for themselves because 
actually you probably know best yeah absolutely and and when it's your great when it's your your family you're you're not going to do anything that's going to hurt the people closest to you and as you say if it's um a situation where somebody is on their last legs um no i, I think yeah. people do need to i totally agree i well I, I, a great way to finish it thank you for being my guinea pig and um <laughs> my pleasure I, I, as i say it was supposed to be a conversation more than an interview which is good because i probably spoke for more of it than you did so I uh, I do appreciate your uh, your thoughts and um, if right. anybody else that uh, listens to this and decides that they want and they feel completely differently and they want to uh, they want to have their say then I'd be happy to uh, listen just comment in the section below wherever this is posted and uh, and I'll try and get back to you but otherwise uh, Paul thank you very much for your time and um, we're well it's uh, four o'clock on a Friday so any no normal time you'd be thinking about. Um, a I'm couple of hours and finishing work and going for a jar. But, uh, I was going to say, I'm going to go and crack one open. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. I haven't got any in the house. But uh, anyway, I'll um, <laughs> I will leave it there. And uh, thanks very much for your time. And um, speaking again soon, I hope. Great. Okay. Cheers, Mark.